Bruce and I began our journey together back in 1990 and 91 when uh, Bruce wrote first an article for Concrete Construction uh, Magazine talking about the issues of flatness and levelness, but also the behavior of various types of structural systems. Uh, he then invited me to co-author a couple of articles with him uh, talking about how you could measure uh, measure slabs, uh, suspended slabs in particular, and how you can uh, construct uh, suspended slabs that are reasonably level. Uh, fast forward to 2009. Uh, by then, we had we had uh, uh, done a couple of things together, uh, but primary among them was was looking at the specification disparity between Division Three and Division Nine, and that has become a, a topic of conversation that uh, is still not resolved. So. It looks like we've got uh, plenty of plenty of work uh, for those who follow behind us, Bruce. Um, but at uh, in 2009, uh, Bruce and I were scheduled to do a seminar for Sunt Corporation in San Diego, and I had just arrived when Bruce sent me a a, a, a text. Uh, actually, it was an email saying that he was sick and wouldn't be able to do it. Now this was a whole day seminar and he and I were supposed to split the time. So those poor people had to listen to me all day long. Not a good thing. You know, I really didn't, I, I really didn't think that Bruce was sick. So I asked him to send me a photograph. And this is where uh, Ken might have, have uh, um, benefited. Uh, <laughs> Bruce sent me this photograph showing that he was really sick. I don't, you know, his tongue is not green at all. So, you know, to this day, I think that he, he uh, might have uh, imbibed a little too much and, and missed his flight. But on with uh, level slabs. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about fabrication and erection tolerances for construction. Uh, we're going to talk, talk about how design options that the uh, engineer uh, chooses can impact uh, the deflection of, of composite systems. Uh, some of the construction problems that face the design construction team. Uh, we'll look at some of the specification approaches that I've, I've seen that uh, are either inappropriate or, or ineffective. Uh, and then finally describe some tools and techniques that the, allow the contractor to respond to the deflection pattern of the structure and, and end up with floors that are reasonably level. Um, first, the impact uh, elements impacting the levelness of deflected floors, uh, fabrication and, and erect, uh, erection of the column and, and the beams. A deflection of the erected frame and then of course placing and finishing techniques. If you look at buildings, uh, it would be really nice if all the buildings that we looked at were nice and rectangular with uniform column bays, uh, but, but for some reason architects or owners don't like that uh, approach. So each building is a unique opportunity to uh, uh, identify and respond to the deflection patterns of the structure. Uh, structural steel tolerances are a really important portion of, of, the, of the entire picture here because the only elevation tolerance that is imposed on a structural steel frame, the erected steel frame, is for base plates. And that's plus or minus an eighth of an inch. After you get above the base plate, Everything is a fabrication tolerance. There's a, a, a tolerance on the length of the columns. Uh, there's a, a tolerance on the location of the beam to column connection, but that's measured from the upper splice point of the column. Uh, there's a tolerance on the, on the camber of beams. Uh, typically it's at minus zero and plus a half an inch for most, uh, for most 
uh, members, that's with the member on its side in the lab, uh, in, the, in the shop after it's been cambered. Uh, what we found with survey data is that these, these cambers are typically, you know, half to three quarters of, of specified camber whenever you get to the field. Uh, did you realize that the location for vent plate or closure plates at the edge of a building is plus or minus three eighths of an inch in any direction? And that's if it's adjustable. So the, the steel people have done a really good job of protecting themselves. <laughs> uh, and the problem is that we've got to deal with it uh, somehow. Uh, this is the way that, that columns are, are designed to fit together. Uh, nice flush fit. Uh, but what you find is that very seldom do you, do you end up with a flush fit as you go up the building. And what most folks don't think about is that every time you have to plumb the column, you create a gap here, but you also create a gap at the top of the column, which creates an effective growth in the length of the column. You know, if you look at the, at the, at, at the impact of just the plumbing operation, if you move a, if you, uh, move a top of the W14 section an inch, typically, uh, in a 20-story building, you can end up with, with, uh, uh, an effective growth that's very close to the the uh, column shortening, uh, differential shortening uh, calculations that sometimes you get from the engineers on higher uh, high-rise buildings. Welcome. Have a seat. Um, just to show the impact of, of what steel erection can do for you, this is a building uh, in Atlanta that we did several years ago. And the, in, the survey data that you see there is the top of column, uh, top of beam elevations, it being column connections. Uh, notice that there's a two inch envelope just in the erected beam to column elevations. And this is at like the 30, 33rd floor of, of the building. So the lesson here for the contractor is to collect data to identify the pre-placement levels of the structural steel. You've got to, I mean, it's, it's kind of like building a cast in place concrete building. You've got to know what you're starting with to be able to control what goes on top of it. Uh, levelness is, is dependent on the uh, accuracy of the formwork and strike off of the concrete, but also on the behavior of the structure after the, after the supports are removed. Uh, and the elephant in the room, of course, is deflection. How do you deal with deflection? How much deflection are you going to deal uh, experience? Uh, some of that is based on the, the design choices made by the structural engineer. Um, there are a couple of steel code uh, design codes. One of them is allow the stress design, uh, which uh, working stress design, uh, and one of them is LRFD, which is an ultimate strength design approach. Uh, the steel folks came up with the ultimate strength design approach to, I, I guess, as a as a match for the ultimate strength design approach used by uh, concrete uh, folks several years ago. The problem is that the LRFD uh, designs stress the steel at a higher level, uh, or allow the steel to be stressed at a higher level, and, and the design solutions that you get are lighter, more shallow members. Uh, one, of the, one of the benefits that we used to have was the use of either a, uh, uh, A36 steel or grade 50 steel, but um, they no longer manufacture white land shapes in grade 36 steel. So we're, luck, we're looked, uh, we're saddled with um, the, the grade 50 steel uh, design. And, and a lot of engineers that don't really take advantage or, or take 
a good look at what the impact of that is on deflection of the structure. Because their primary focus is on life safety issues. You know, if it doesn't fall down, then it's in pretty good shape. Uh, and a lot of times when you, you know, I was the lead engineer on a 50-story building in Dallas, and the, the focus was on, you know, get it, get it up. And the, the members spanned from, from a perimeter to core, and after the structure was up and they started doing the tenant work, found out that there was like a two and a half inch bird bath or sag at mid-span on every darn floor. Not a good situation uh, for the contractor and a really unhappy situation when he had to uh, talk and, and arrive at a solution with the, with the owner. Um, just to look at the impact of, uh, of the differences in allowable stress design and, and LRFD, uh, look at a typical 30 by 30 bay, beams at 10 feet on the center, uh, looking at the secondary beams, carrying typical office building loads with, uh, with mechanical, electrical, you know, 20 pounds of partitions, those kinds of things. Uh, the design solution, if you're using grade 50 steel, is a 14 by 22. The, the dead load deflection of that uh, solution would be an inch, a little over an inch and a half. If you use LRFD, take full advantage of, of, the, uh, of, of that design approach. Using grade 50, you end up with 12 by 19. A 12 by 19 spanning 30 feet. What do you think the deflection on that is going to be? Over a couple of inches, two and a half feet. <clears throat> and that's the kind of deflection that the engineer would have to deal with. Now, uh, of, cor of course, uh, we, we've seen that. Uh, I've seen it in, in real life. Uh, and it's not a pretty sight. Um, the, the lesson here for the designer is not to take full advantage of LRFD design uh, solutions. Uh, can remember deflections. Um, Anybody here remember Darrell Royal? Texas, uh, University of Texas uh, football coach, uh, ran the wishbone uh, offense for, for years very successfully. He said three things about the forward pass. He said, three things can happen, two of them are bad. <laughs> and that's pretty much the same story for Cambridge members. Uh, you can end up with residual camber. You can end up with uh, sometimes uh, members that deflect down to a level position, or you can end up with an over deflection. This is a situation that we typically run into uh, over deflection. Um, I talked to you about a 12 and 19 spanning 30 feet. Uh, this was a uh, an example of 12 and 19 spanning 30 feet. They were originally cambered two and a half inches. Uh, the uh, contractor stopped placing concrete when the members passed two and a half inches and approached an inch and a half of over deflection. Uh, not a, not happy. The, these uh, shores, by the way, weren't there <laughs> initially. And until after they stopped placing concrete, uh, not a happy, not a happy day. So, what does a what does the uh, engineer do uh, in terms of cameraing strategy? Uh, one of the things to do is to realize that uh, that you're probably not going to have the camera that you call for on the job site on, on the drawings present in the job site. Uh, projects that we get involved with, we have, we have this, the steel surveyed in advance, you know, before concrete placement. Uh, and just look at the variation in, in uh, camber, in place camber. Uh, we measured the, the, took the elevation of, of each end and mid-span of these members, calculated the reflection, and all of them were supposed to have three quarters of an inch camber uh, this one had uh, less than half an inch, and this one had more than three quarters of an inch. 
So, and, and they could have been side by side. You know, those are the kind of things, you know, differentials that you would have to deal with if you're placing concrete to uniform uh, thickness. Um, another issue to look at is you don't always have cambered members. You don't always have uncambered members. Uh, what we've got here is a hospital project uh, in which the red, the red members are moment frames, lateral resistance systems. Stiff as all get out, they're not going anywhere under gravity load. Uh, the the, the uh, blue members are cambered uh, and the green members are uncambered. And the direction from the uh, engineer was to basically place concrete until it's level. <laughs> you know, it, without, without any direction as to what, what the behavior of the structure was likely to be. So the important thing to remember is that one size does not fit all. One cambering approach doesn't fit all, all members. Uh, what we found is that members that frame into columns uh, typically design uh, deflect about 70 to 80 percent of the of the pin pin calculated deflection. Uh, the members that frame into girders deflect more, and that's because the uh, of the resistance of the rotation, you know, resistance to rotation of the beam column connection relative to the resistance to rotation of the beam to the side of the girder, you know, much less stiff. So. Uh, that, that's an issue. Uh, you need to look at the deflection of the system and not just the individual members. Uh, say, for example, you've got a girder <coughs> with no camera. Well, that doesn't mean it's not going to deflect. Uh, you're going to end up with probably a half to five-eighths of an inch deflection. And you've got uh, secondary members that frame into those primary members and, and they're cambered for 70 to 80 percent typically of calculated deflection because the engineer doesn't want to have a hump in the floor after the concrete's placed. Well, you know, first the ends of the secondary members are going to drop because the, the girders are deflecting. And second, the, the deflection of the secondary members is likely going to be more than the engineer thought it was going to be just because of the of the of the torsional resistance of the of the girders. So you end up if everything behaves exactly the way the engineer thinks it's going to, you're going to end up with three quarters of an inch to an inch deflection or uh, bird bath in every bath. Not a good situation. Um, that's uh, and then um, so so for for engineers uh, the the lesson here is to use a camera strategy that looks at the combined movements of of both girders and beams uh, to look at the overall levelness of the deflected system um, from a concrete placing standpoint. Um, it, I've, I've heard uh, folks say, just keep placing concrete until it's level. Well, <laughs> that is kind of an issue from a concrete placing standpoint. If you have a typical rectangular building, and I made it a lot more simple than probably most buildings are, but you know, your placement strip is typically about 30 to uh, um, about 15 feet wide, and your placement strip is about uh, 100 feet, you know, 100 <coughs> feet long. Um, by the time you finish this first placement strip and come back and start your next placement strip, uh, it takes your third placement strip before this first bay is fully loaded. Uh, and it takes structural steel about 30 to 45 minutes after it's been loaded to, to relax into its final reflected shape. So the idea of using a, a rod and level to establish, uh, you know, uh, an elevation the top slab elevation <coughs> is is problematic. 
So placing and finishing techniques. Uh, I've already talked to you about using a riding level. Uh, my, my preference is to gauge up off the steel. Uh, and that's because the, the structural system is moving the entire time you're placing concrete. Every time you add more concrete, you get more movement of the system. Uh, not, a, not a good situation. There are lots of ways to gauge up off the steel. Uh, one of them is to use great uh, pins. The, these are made out of welded wire fabric, which I think happens to be the best use I can think of for welded wire fabric. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps it off the deck and, and, and folks don't trip over it. Uh, but they color coded it for different, you know, for different uh, areas. Uh, you can use, uh, you know, uh, uh, screed systems that that you you measure, uh, you place them over the beams, and that controls the thickness of, of the strike off. Uh, and if you got an area where you need to increase the thickness, you can you can uh, do that with with these. Uh, uh, adjustments here. Uh, so the lesson here for the contractor is to collect data that allows early identification of structural behavior. You want to know how that system is behaving. I mean, if you've got a 30 or 40 story building, uh, or even a 20 story building, once you get to the second or third floor, the, the frame is going to be pretty repetitive. If you're making a mistake on the, in, in terms, if, if the floors at the third and fourth level, uh, third and fourth floors aren't reasonably level, then the 17th, 18th, and 19th floors aren't going to be level either if you use the same thing, uh, use the same approach. Um, <coughs> so what have I seen from, from engineers uh, uh, as, a, as a way of addressing deflection? <coughs> well, first I see uh, the use of guide documents, referencing guide documents as, as mandatory requirements in the specifications. Totally inappropriate. Guide level documents are not written in mandatory language and if the specifier wishes to make uh, any content in a guide level document mandatory, then it's incumbent on the specifier to include that language in his project manual or in his project specifications in mandatory language. And just to reinforce, here's the, the uh, a little blurb that you see at the beginning of every guide level document. And specifically it says, don't use this as a reference. How many designers are in a group? Don't use guide level documents is a reference document. Um, I've, I've seen uh, for slab film metal deck, I've seen levelless numbers specified. Uh, you, the uh, ACL 117 specifically says that one, there is no elevation tolerance on, on uh, the erected steel frame. And that's because of all the fabrication tolerances that we just that we discussed earlier. And the other is that there is no levelness tolerance, uh, FL levelness tolerance, on the floors uh, because the move, because the the system is moving the entire time the concrete is being placed. Um, and then I see this. Concrete thickness is nominal and minimal. Yeah. Due to the weight of wet concrete, deflection is estimated to be about an inch. Uh, camber has been documented as indicated. Provide additional concrete is required to make up for actual project deflection. Now, the, the problem with this is that the, the the, this project had different base sizes, had different framing situations, both in terms of, of cambered and uncambered girders and cambered and uncambered beams. How the heck do you know what's going to happen? Um, in the concrete notes, uh, 
composite deck shall be capable of supporting the loads can, uh, described in the specs. Uh, members are designed as unsured unless noted otherwise. Uh, to be finished level. Now, <laughs> level is level. And there ain't no such thing as a level slab on metal deck. I'm here to tell you. I've seen, I've seen millions of square feet of, of slab on metal deck. Uh, but the contractor is supposed to take care of this in construction. And this is the diagram that they include uh, for the benefit of the contractor. Really nice picture. Doesn't, doesn't work well at all in practice. So the, the unanswered questions are, what's the elevation of the support of steel? Does the fabricated camber match that that's required? How much deflection is going to occur in key members? Uh, how much estimated mid-bay deflection is accounted for by cambering? Does a con what does a contractor do if camera members don't deflect to level after loading? And what does the contractor do if additional thickness required is significantly more than anticipated? Now, by significantly more than anticipated, I'm talking about three quarters of an inch or so. Um, metal deck will typically deflect about half to three quarters of an inch between supporting beams. So if you have, say, a five and a quarter inch slab, you've got a six inch slab mid span of that metal deck. Now, you start adding thickness to that, to that system. And you end up with, um, uh, say, six and three quarters of an inch, or, or seven inches or more. At what point does it become a safety issue for the contractor? I mean, metal deck is placed in strips that are tack welded side by side. You know, at some point, the combined weight of the of the construction crew and the concrete is going to cause those those seams to split, and it becomes a, a really serious safety issue for the contractor. So we personally uh, don't don't increase the the thickness any more than three quarters of an inch, and and we use that with with caution. Um, 117, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, says that there is no elevation clause for slabs on metal bed. Um, what we're going to talk about in this next section is how you fix this. <laughs> there is a solution, uh, and we've been doing it for, you know, gosh, since 88. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not new, it's not rocket science. Um, one of the things that you do is uh, include pre and post placement surveys of the structural steel. It's really important to know, one, what you're starting with, in term, particularly in terms of cambered members, and two, by post, post placement, how those members behave during, during construction. Uh, design options to mitigate the impact of, of deflection. We talked about camber strategy earlier. Uh, utilize a controlled method of strike off, uh, and then use survey data to respond to unanticipated behavior. Uh, what we do is measure the fabricated camber in the shop. Uh, would ideally you would you would ask them to attach that to the to the uh, members from their ship, and then survey, survey, survey. Uh, survey prior to construction to establish the relative levels of the beam to column connections and the camera beams, and then survey following concrete to establish the value of the structure. And then how do you respond to the structure uh, deflection behavior? Uh, first, if deflection past level is small, then I'm, I'm saying less than three quarters of an inch, then you can maintain design thickness at the ends of the members and increase the thickness slightly at mid-span to decrease the uh, differential between the ends and, and mid-span. Uh, essentially what you're doing is gauging up off the steel by an increased amount 
Uh, and what that does is give you the material that is, you know, after the member deflects, the material to, to re-straighten and create a reasonably level surface. And that's kind of what it looks like, ideally. Uh, if the deflection past the level is large, or if the members can, then uh, we could have we could have used the solution I'm about to talk to you in this situation. Uh, what you do is use a loose shore. A loose shore uh, is attached at mid span of the beam prior to concrete. Now you don't have to hang it from the shore. Uh, hang it from the beam. You, it, there are lots of systems now that have that have you can clamp it to the to the flange of the beam, let it sit on the floor, and let the collar of the shores uh, establish the gap. Uh, you can uh, use tripod mounts on the base and then and leave the gap at the top of the shores. But what you do there is is set this gap equal to the amount of movement that you want to let take place. You maintain design thickness at the ends and mid span when you when you strike off the concrete. Uh, when the desired deflection is taking place, and the shore stops the movement. Now, why does loose shoring work? We're stopping the we're stopping the concrete or stopping the movement of the beam while the concrete is still plastic. The beam was carrying the load until until the shore started, you know, stopped the movement, started picking up the load. Well, when you have composite behavior, once the concrete hardens, then you've got a section, the steel beam and the and the floor framing just a short side on you know short distance on either side. It's a composite section. Three to five times as stiff as the beam just by itself. So if you would have had an inch of over deflection, if you stop it at level, then you might have gotten a quarter of an inch of additional movement when you pull the shoulders. This is an example of, of the uh, loose shoring here. We, we had a three quarter inch gap. That's before concreting and after concreting. Um, another thing you need to take a look at is perimeter perimeter closure and and closure around and, uh, around openings because if you'll remember the tolerance on closure angles, it's not all that good in terms of of uh, controlling uh, the 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 thickness and elevation of of the concrete. So you might have to. Do you know survey the survey the perimeter of your openings and and use supplemental material to to give you a strike a, a control a control point uh, to to give you the thickness you need at that location. Uh, using uh, control methods of strike off, uh, gauging up uh, here. Uh, this is from project in Boston. They use wet spread wet spread strike off, they, they uh, establish thickness at control points and then use a magic screed uh, to, you know, to strike off the concrete. Uh, they've, uh, they've been able to produce uh, routinely uh, flatness numbers in the, the mid, mid 30s to, to low 40s. Um, the other thing that's, that's important here is to recognize that not only do you get a little bit of movement when you remove the shores, you get some additional deflection uh, as a result of creep uh, as, the, as the compression, you know, the, the floor portion, the concrete portion of the slab uh, compresses. Uh, uh, you get maybe a, an, another quarter of an inch of, of movement. So we typically uh, try to stop the beam or, or the, the canvas members a little bit high so that when, when the shores are removed and, and finally deflect to the final uh, location, 
you end up with a reasonably uh, level four. Um, that's all I know, but I wanted to take this opportunity to, to thank Bruce. Uh, we have worked together for many years on, on a lot of different issues. Most, decent, most recently uh, uh, on uh, slab uh, thickness tolerances for, for slabs on ground, uh, which has been, uh, and, and for paving, which has been a, a, a real need in the industry for years. Um, what, I, what I've experienced in Bruce over the years is that he sees an issue uh, and, and develops or helps develop a solution. And for that, I admire it.